Coming up on Tech News Today, Satoshi Nakamoto is still a mystery wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a blockchain. Walmart disrupts mobile payments and get help with your bad internet manners. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, December 10th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With the Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using just your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping in time for the holidays when you go to ring.com slash TNT. This episode is brought to you also by Braintree. Looking to set up payments for your business? Braintree gives your app or website a payment solution that accepts just about every payment method with one simple integration. Plus, Braintree will give you the first $50,000 in transactions fee-free. To learn more, visit braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I am Megan Maroney. Mike Elgin has returned to his nomadic lifestyle roaming the earth for tech news. Uh, since his chair was open, I went ahead and took it. Uh, and our co-anchor today is Fusion Editor Kashmir Hill, who I am very excited to talk to because I have been following your work for a long time. This is the first time we talked. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Megan. It's nice to... Uh, be hosting with you. <laughs> yes, agreed. Uh, so you always have fantastic and compelling security privacy stories. Uh, and I am so glad to talk to you this week um, because it is one of the biggest, most beautiful uh, stories uh, that I've seen in a while. Uh, Craig S. Wright, the guy who may or may not be Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, is has been in the news um, trying to uncover the story. Wired Gizmodo, Motherboard, uh, you have also weighed in. Uh, what do you think? Yes, this is the latest Satoshi Nakamoto. It's not the first time that a publication has claimed to unmask him. Uh, Wired and Gizmodo had some pretty compelling evidence, a lot of emails that go back very far, where uh, this Australian that most of us had never heard of before um, had various communications where he talked about being Satoshi and talked about how, you know, his alter ego was getting more famous than he was. Um, the thing is, uh, so this anonymous uh, person who leaked these emails um, they claimed to be a like coworker of Craig Wright's, who was kind of like dissatisfied with him. But this person shopped it around to lots of different publications. He went to somebody at the New York Times. He went to the woman who wrote the Newsweek cover that said Satoshi Nakamoto uh, was Dorian Nakamoto. Uh, which was later debunked. So this person went to a lot of people. They were really, really, really wanted to out Craig Wright as Satoshi Nakamoto. And when I looked like more closely at the evidence, I started to think that maybe the anonymous person who was leaking the story was Craig Wright himself. Um, and you know, whenever you get a tip from an, an anonymous source, then you have to wonder about the motivations of the tipper. Um, and then Sarah Zhang at Motherboard found that it looked like the PGP keys that seemed to be proving that this was indeed Satoshi Nakamoto had been faked. Um, so to me, it's really starting to look like this is uh, yet another uh, misidentification of Bitcoin's creator uh, and that it may indeed be some kind of hoax. So what do you think about this story from a journalism perspective? I think it's interesting, like Andy Greenberg from Wired, a great reporter, um, but you know, he, his story was, he used the word probably. Uh, and so when the motherboard uh, information about the possibly faked uh, PGP keys came out, um, he said, well, we were, you know, on Twitter, he says, we did say probably, we did say it might've been a hoax. Um, it's interesting because I mean, as we rush to uh, be the first person to break all these stories, it seems like I've seen a lot of just sort of hedging of bets. You know, I think that uh, Gizmodo was kind of doing that the same. We, you know, they, they said, this is, this is, might be him, but uh, you know, it might not be. So what do you think about this story from, from a journalism perspective? I think it proves how hard it is to um, authenticate electronic uh, evidence. And we see this happen a lot in criminal trials now where people point to various things and say, you know, this proves that this person did that. Um, but I think we've seen in the long hunt for Satoshi Nakamoto that even with his many emails, uh, many communications with various people in the Bitcoin community, it's still really hard to figure out who this guy is. Um, and it kind of goes against some of the things that 
uh, we think uh, are provable in our electronically documented age. Um, I did think that, and Andy is uh, an amazing reporter. Um, I used to work with Andy Greenberg, and I, I really, when he said he found Satoshi Nakamoto, I thought this has to be it. Um, but he was very careful and hedged and said, you know, indeed, this may be an elaborate hoax. Uh, and this person just really wants us to think that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto for some reason. Um, so, yeah, it's always good to be skeptical as a journalist, as we as we well know. Uh, so last night I talked to the Guardian reporter who had, was there when uh, when they came to his home and the police came to Craig Wright's home. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin is not illegal. Creating Bitcoin is not illegal. Uh, and they, they, the police said this is not related. Uh, what do you think about that part of the story? Do you think that um, that they were raiding his home for another reason and, you know, and uh, Andy's story just sort of led them to him? Uh, or do you think that it, it, there is a connection there? I, that is the weirdest part of this. And it's really hard for me to speculate whether it's related to the stories or if, um, the timing of the stories is related to something that was going on in, in Wright's life. Um, I think it's very odd. They did say it doesn't have to do with him being the creator of Bitcoin, but it could have to do with the fact that he's very involved in cryptocurrencies. He has a lot of like Bitcoin businesses. And so maybe um, sometimes people that are involved in Bitcoin get into tax trouble. Um, so it could be that it is related to that. One of the most interesting things about this story is we talk so much about privacy and how you can never keep anything secret and, uh, you know, everyone knows everything about you. And this just shows that if you really want to uh, keep your identity a secret uh, and you know how to do it, you still can. Yeah, I mean, Satoshi Nakamoto seems, I don't know, uh, there are various people who have been identified. I think that there's one person who is more likely to be Satoshi Nakamoto than the rest. Um, but yeah, it is it is possible to have privacy. You just have to be, you know, a, a crypto genius who invented, you know, the one successful cryptocurrency. And then yes, maybe if you're that guy, you can be really, really good about your opsec and keep people from finding out who you are. But for the average person, uh, you should still read Kashmir's articles about how how to stay private. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the news. Walmart is releasing a new form of mobile payment called Walmart Pay. Uh, it will be on iOS and Android next year. It won't so much be a competitor to Apple Pay or to Android Pay. Uh, according to a piece in Forbes, Walmart Pay will break up the consortium that uh, was creating Currency, which was supposed to be a competitor to Apple Pay. Um, have you been following the, the mobile payments uh, war, I guess I'll call it, uh, Kashmir? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I would call it a war. Um, it seems like some people are doing better than others. Um, it, it seems like people are more excited about using things like Venmo that have like a social aspect to, to payments. Um, one thing I wondered when I saw this story is just how does Walmart convince people to use Walmart pay as opposed to just using um, their usual credit card or cash? Right, I mean, that's the thing. It hasn't caught on. I mean, I still use, you know, uh, Apple Pay and get looks when I'm doing it. So it, it hasn't become uh, mainstream at all. But I mean, if, if you know, if if Walmart is able to uh, make mobile payments mainstream, then then I think that they, you know, then that's what we'll be using. I, I do think that's what we'll be using. But I think uh, if Walmart is successful with it, then I think I will catch on because they're such they're so popular in the U.S. Yeah. And at some point, I mean, it's a pain to carry around a bunch of credit cards. Like it's not a good solution. It is insecure. You know, you have your number on the front of it. Um, uh, it, it makes it easy to steal. So, I mean, it makes sense that we'd move to mobile for payments or some other more secure way. Um, it just doesn't seem like any of these apps are getting enough traction to be the one uh, that's going to win or the one that is going to move us wholesale over to, to paying this way. Well, I think that's what is keeping the average person from using it, their belief that it's uh, more uh, insecure than using your credit card, than handing your credit card over to someone, uh, having them take it into the back room, um, you know, at a restaurant and handing it back. For some reason, uh, people just don't trust technology in that way. Uh, what do you think is going to take, um, what, what do you think it's going to take to change people's minds and, and convince them that electronic payments are more secure than credit cards? Oh man, I I don't know. I mean, it may just be you have to convince the you know the millennials to do it, and then they'll convince their parents to do it, and they'll convince their grandparents to do it. Um, I kind of think they need to get some really dedicated user group 
that will then, you know, spread it out. Um, I, I don't know how they convince that that group of people, but you know, maybe if you target people who are very young, who um, who don't have kind of a set way of paying for things yet, that would work. Well, we will see. Maybe 2016 will be the year that it will be accepted. Uh, so our first guest tonight is the hilarious and insightful writer, Mallory Ortberg. Mallory is co-founder of the website, The Toast. She is author of Texts from Jane Eyre, and most recently is Slate's new Dear Prudence. Uh, that is an online column about manners and morals. And she is here tonight to today to answer a few questions that we had about tech manners and morals. Welcome, Mallory. Hey, Megan. Thanks for coming on. So uh, you're the author of Texts from Jane Eyre, uh, so yeah. I have decided that you are the foremost expert on literary texting. Uh, so there's a new study, uh, you might have heard, it says that ending a text with a period is seen as less sincere. Uh, what do you recommend? Do you think that people should do away with punctuation in favor of sincerity while they're texting? Oh man, I mean, ending a text with a period is is aggressive. It means you're furious. Like, especially if it's just the word okay and then a period, that's... <laughs> That's grounds for a fist fight. I mean, it's brutal. And um, yeah, I think punctuation in text is an incredibly fraught subject. But if you're going to end something with a period, know what you're doing. Know what you're getting yourself into. It's a bold, aggressive move. And you should be pretty careful. This must show my age because I totally use per- I was like going through my text messages and I definitely use periods. Oh, I like well, if you, if you write your text the correct. way you would write a sentence exempt yourself from this conversation. <laughs> and everyone who reads your text understands that you're using proper punctuation. But like, I feel like a lot of people understand there's a big difference between writing out the word okay versus just O and K versus KK versus K versus K with a period, which is essentially a polite way of saying fuck you. Am I allowed to say fuck you on this podcast? No, but um, I'm sorry I didn't tell you that before. <laughs> That's okay. I, we can definitely I edit it out. Okay, period. <laughs> Yeah, we can. Well, I don't use okay in text messages anymore. I just send an emoji thumbs up. There you go. See, you've you've avoided the problem entirely. You've (laughs) transcended language. You're communicating entirely via signifiers and have moved to a higher class of being. (laughs) I've evolved. So uh, I think Kashmir has a couple questions too. I have have one uh, because she's drinking her coffee, I can see. Um, So the Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year for 2015. Uh, is the laughing with tears of joy emoji, which is my favorite emoji. It's how I move through life. Uh, So when do you think emoji are appropriate and not appropriate uh, for conversation? I'm talking about texts or Twitter um, in real life. uh, When are they appropriate and not appropriate? Oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer this question very well, but I will answer it with that disclaimer. (laughs) Um, I think if appropriate is, is is what you're targeting, you know, use your best judgment. Unfortunately, I don't really use emoji until very, very recently. I had an old Android phone. So all emoji showed up as little square text or little square boxes, I should say. Um, so I never really got into the hang of using them. Um, but I mean, you, you know, when a smiling face is appropriate and when it would be inappropriate, like if your mom texts to say, grandma just died, call me, like, don't send a sad face call her. Good point. Yeah, I feel I feel like people know this one. Mm-hmm. I Max Reed just did a really great article about various emoji and his his kind of theories behind them for I think New York Magazine. So, you should ask him next. <laughs> I will. Good. So, Mallory, I was looking over you, you know, you've been you're basically a month into your dear prudence um, mm-hmm. role and I was looking at one of your first chats. Uh, where somebody was asking, there's all these like just crazy new conundrums uh, presented by this world of technology and data collection and uh, data access that we live in. And so this woman um, had written in because somebody was going into her work email and printing up old emails, um, like years old emails that were embarrassing and um, posting them around the office, and I, which I thought was just an insane... Uh, it, an insane it horrified situation. Me. And she was Can like, should I tell my boss? That? What's that? No, I was just thinking, can you imagine someone doing that to you? Like think of anything you might have said over email over the last 10 years. It is, it is, it is my nightmare. And I think you pointed out that, you know, maybe she was hacked by a coworker or maybe the IT department was going into her email box and there was somebody who didn't like her there or maybe her boss um, who probably has access to 
her email mm -hmm. if he or she wants it. But I was just wondering, like, what are the, the, the like, what's the strangest kind of tech etiquette or tech advice question that you've seen so far? And kind of what's your philosophy in addressing these, these types of novel, novel problems? Man, you know, I think that actually might have been the most outrageous tech question I've been asked so far. Um, and I, I expect to get plenty more of them. But that one was just so crazy making because, like you said, it could have been a disgruntled coworker that she had originally sent those emails to. It could be someone in the IT department who has access to whatever's on the servers. It could be her boss if she has a really upsetting boss with bad boundaries. Um, and there's just that kind of crazy making instance of, I don't know who this is or what their end game is. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people wanted, wanted to kind of write in and say, well, obviously the answer to this is don't say anything in email you wouldn't want printed out and put on your desk, which is great uh -huh. advice. But it's also sort of like, you can't do that retroactively. And I think a lot of us know at some point we've said something really dumb or thoughtless or mean or unkind or just stupid over email sometime in our lives. Um, and you can't take that back or dismiss it the way you can something stupid you said in conversation eight years ago. Yeah, uh, I just don't think we can live that way where you just assume that every single thing that you ever write could possibly be exposed to the whole world. That would be crazy making. I mean, I think it's great to you know adopt that as a policy going forward to remember that there's a lot of avenues we have of communicating with people via the written word that we used to do more verbally. So it's always really helpful to remember like, Maybe your Gchat logs shouldn't look like a garbage fire all the time. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's reasonable to not expect your coworkers to print out your old emails and leave them lying around the office. I think that that's, that's a definite no. I think you shouldn't do that. I'm going to come out against it strongly. <laughs> and this, my friends, is why you should use end-to-end -end encryption. So if somebody does stumble <laughs> into your inbox, they can't read the things that you wrote. There we go. Great advice. Uh, so I have noticed a, a trend just in the past few weeks um, because on Facebook, so many issues are politically charged. I mean, I think we're just like a nervous world right now. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, I will say mostly women, starting posts about gun control or Dr Donald Trump or, or any of those issues. They started out with, I usually don't like to talk about politics here or, um, you know, I'm sorry for talking about politics here. Um, in this day and age, is there any reason to apologize for taking a political stance on Facebook or other social media? Mm. I, I know what you mean. I remember when I saw your question, I thought, yeah, I've seen that too. And uh, there's a lot of other instances where I would say, no, you don't need to apologize for having a political opinion or preface any kind of strong feeling you might have with a sort of, I'm really sorry, I feel strongly about this. Um, but I think what they're doing makes sense to me, uh, which is that a lot of people, especially generally sensible people maybe, um, feel like people getting into political arguments on Facebook is something that usually happens by accident. It's really frustrating. Sometimes it involves someone you used to work with and a distant cousin yelling at each other on your page and you're getting notifications about how they're both Hitler. Um, so I can kind of understand someone saying, look, I know that our Facebook connections often involve a lot of social obligations. We have a lot of relationships on here that aren't necessarily the people we agree with the most. Um, so we don't post a lot of political stuff here and you might not have been expecting to see it here. Um, but I feel so strongly that I'm going to kind of break with the convention of normally posting goofy dog videos or fun pictures of my trip to the beach um, by talking about something that I feel really strongly about. So I understand that the apology is almost more of a heads up. I'm going to talk about something really serious. Um, and I apologize in advance if the comments section turn into just a mud slinging session. So you don't think that it's, it's really like the table. Like, I mean, that's what, you know, you, we were always taught growing up. You never talk about money and politics at the table. Uh, you know, you don't think Facebook is like the, the dinner, the dinner table. Well, you know, I've seen a lot of conversations with people where they kind of talk about now they'll talk more politics on Twitter. Uh, and because often Facebook, they have a lot of like relatives who might be friends or old coworkers or people who they might disagree with a lot of the time, but feel kind of obligated to maintain that social tie. They try to keep Facebook lighter. Um, so I think it's totally fine to say, oh, here's this social media channel I do not normally use for espousing my political views, but because it's people I'm really close with and this issue makes me feel really strongly... Um, I need to bring it up in this context. And I want to sort of acknowledge that that's unusual. 
Um, it doesn't seem like, and maybe, I don't know, maybe your friends are really different. Maybe they're, maybe they're posting just abject apologies that are like, I'm so sorry I have this political opinion. Please set my hair on fire. I'm the worst, but I have to say this. But if they're just sort of acknowledging, this is unusual, but I really have to do this or feel that I have to. Right. I think that's fine. I think it is more of the, here, you know, let me, here's the segue from the funny dog video um, to yes. something serious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Kashmir had another question. Oh, I do have one, uh, one last question. So I've been kind of on a crusade this year uh, to get people to turn off the noise on their smartphones when they're in public. Because I just don't want to hear other people's rings, or other people's beeps, given that we all have our phones basically on our bodies and it could just vibrate. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm wondering what you think about this and whether you are with me on this crusade to get people to turn the noise off on their smartphones or if you think they should be allowed uh, to make as much noise as they want. Well, I think the most important thing is that we all agree it is a crusade and that anyone's different opinions on how they handle their smartphone is a salvo in a war and we have to fight each other. <laughs> um, no, but that's, it's, it's so fraught, I think, because there's uh, it's such strong feelings and there's folks who feel really resentful of the way in which a smartphone has become kind of an extension of the human body for a lot of people. And they feel like it's encroaching upon their space in a way that's really frustrating. And other people, I don't know if you saw Mara Wilson's tweet about this a while back, but it was just kind of a really fun antidote to some of that, which was an imagined dialogue. The first one was something like, put down your phone and engage with people. And her response was, fine, I'll stop reading the news and connecting with loved ones far away. Um, to sort of point out that we don't use our smartphones differently from how we interact with people we're standing next to, if that makes sense. Um, like we're, both of them are social interactions. Both of them are learning. Both of them are engaging. Um, this is a very long way of getting to your question, which is, should we make our phones quieter in public? And I think that's a great idea. Yes. I usually will put my phone on a super, super low ringtone or silent. Um, if I leave the house, just because I also know I'm not going to miss anything. Do you know what I mean? Like I pick up my smartphone every minute. I'm not going to miss a text. Um, I don't need an alert. Like I turned off my Twitter alert years ago because I'm just always scrolling through Twitter, um, mm -hmm. which is maybe just a concession to becoming part cyborg. But yeah, yeah, I will tentatively say it's a great idea to turn your phone on silent when you leave the house, um, unless you know someone really important is going to call you, I guess. All right, I'm adding you to the list of crusaders. <laughs> wow, wow, sorry, that was not exactly a full-throated endorsement, but yes, feel free to dial it up and put me on your list. <laughs> Uh, so I have one last question for you. Apple uh, just named the best apps for 2015. Uh, one of them was Twitter's live streaming tool, Periscope. I don't know if you've used it before. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you just can live stream your life, uh, what you're seeing. Uh, so what is some etiquette, uh, some guidance on etiquette for, for live streaming? That's a great question. I've never used Periscope and I've never viewed Periscope. So I am uniquely unqualified to answer this question. Well, maybe I should ask Kashmir because she's a privacy expert. Uh, what yeah, do you think? Ask about, <laughs> what do you think? Because I know it's it's illegal to uh, record people's voices, right? But not necessarily. It, there's different rules between uh, recording a conversation and a video, right? Yeah, I mean, so there's the question of etiquette, and then there's the question of legality. Um, uh, I would. I'm not a lawyer, but I would not advise somebody to periscope secretly um, with uh, you know from a private residence. Uh, etiquette wise, I think you should ask people, are you okay with being broadcast live right now? In the same way that you might ask them if you're going to quote them and like, uh, uh put it out on Twitter, um, saying it's them that said it. Uh, I think it's just, you know, make sure people are comfortable with what is currently happening around them immediately going to either a small audience or depending on how large your Periscope audience is a very, a very, very big one. Well, Mallory, I think you should get on Periscope. You can Periscope yourself playing Scrabble or um, writing or anything like that. People would oh want to see it. that Scrabble question. <laughs> yeah, you're I'm not sure, allowed to talk about that either. <laughs> I'm sure someone might, but I have no interest in being filmed doing any of those things. So I will not be Periscoping myself. But if someone wants to, go crazy. I'm sure it's going <laughs> to revolutionize the cam girl industry in some form or another. Well, Mallory, I really appreciate you coming on, especially because I forgot to tell you it was video, uh, that we have been videotaping you, just so you know, <laughs> or recording you with video is what I should say. <laughs> That's great. And broadcasting it live. Yes. yes. Uh, Mallory.
Mallory Ortberg uh, can be found on Slate, at The Toast, and on Twitter at Mal Ellis. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. This episode is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. The Ring Video Doorbell lets you see and speak to anyone at your door from anywhere using your smartphone. But it's more than just stopping would-be burglars in their tracks. Of course, this time of the year, you are probably getting packages sent to the house for the holidays. With Ring, you can talk to delivery people and keep an eye on your package. If someone tries to mess with it, you'll get an instant alert and an HD video of the whole thing. It's like having a neighbor keep an eye on your home 24-7. Installing Ring takes minutes. It works with either your current wiring or built-in rechargeable battery. And this year, you can give the gift of peace of mind and convenience with the video doorbell. Time Magazine named one of their top 10 gadgets. So go to ring.com slash TNT for free expedited FedEx shipping. That's ring.com slash TNT. With Ring, you are always home. So Engadget has a review of a new wearable that's been called a drill sergeant for your face. Uh, I think we have a little bit of the video uh, from of the device. Wearables, biometrics, monitoring, tracking. What are we missing? We have the hardware. We have the data. Are we happy yet? After all, it's the holidays, the hap happiest season of all. So how do we know if we're happy or happy enough? Introducing Jolly, the first wearable that tracks how often you smile. So he is wearing a Santa Claus beard. We've gotten to the point where we're comfortable with technology touching us, not just on a surface level, but it's reading our most intimate biometrics. And we thought, how can we take that intimacy and use that as outward spiraling connective tissue to improve humanity and the world in general? And we thought the best way to do that was, was through a beard. All right, so we have got one journalist who's been patiently waiting on the line. He has reviewed the Jolly Tracker. Uh, and welcome Terrence O'Brien from Engadget. Uh, thanks for coming on, Terrence. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the Jolly Tracker. Uh, so the Jolly Tracker is a Santa beard. So imagine this lovely thing gone and giant white beard here uh, that has electrodes that measure whether or not you're smiling, watching the feedback from your muscles. And then if you don't smile, there's other electrodes that shock you and give you a gentle reminder that you should be happy. So uh, we should say before we go on, this is an ad for an ad agency. Uh, it's of not. <laughs> it's not a real uh, wearable. It might, some people might think it should be, uh, but uh, it, it is really an ad. So um, yeah, I mean, thing. press companies need to advertise themselves sometimes, and they do these weird little creative things like this. And you know, it's it's a fun experiment, but no, you're not going to see it on shelves this holiday season, unfortunately. It's a Christmas Fool's Day ad, but I do yeah. think. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, obviously, no one would want this, but you could imagine uh, uh, instances in which people might actually want this. I remember um, I lived in China during the 2008 Olympics, and there, the uh, everybody who was working on the Olympic Games had to smile all the time, uh, and they were going around and telling people, "Oh, you're not smiling enough." Like you could totally imagine them instead of having them monitored by human beings, making them wear some kind of device that would force them to smile more. Oh, absolutely. I was actually talking to a couple of friends yesterday about it, uh, guys who happened to be in sales and in PR, and they were saying that, you know, it'd be really good to help train new hires to smile more because it's like a really important thing for making a connection with your clients. I don't know if it's legal to shock new hires. I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but... <laughs> but um, so I don't know. I think, I think it's okay. <laughs> uh, so you you actually tried this. It's a it was a real device. Um, did it really shock you? Oh yeah, no, it shocked me. Um, so yeah, behind the beard itself, there's a whole bunch of things that you can't see. There's an Arduino. There's this thing called the muscle spiker shield, which is what's actually measuring whether or not your muscles are moving. And then there's a tens device, which is generally used for applying mild electric shocks for like therapeutic purposes. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you, you put all these electrodes on and it monitors it. There's just an app and it shocks you and it shocked me pretty good. And we only had it up to about half power. And I'll, I'll admit that it was pretty painful after a while. Uh, the first time it's more of just a shock and a jolt, but 
after wearing it for 15 minutes straight doing this video that uh, we're, we're watching now, uh, I, I was in a little bit of pain. <laughs> were you smiling more afterwards? Or were oh, you grimacing oh, yeah. from the pain? No, no, I was smiling in fear. Um, the, <laughs> I, I, it took me a while to stop smiling because I had just been doing this for like 15 minutes. It was amazing. So could could someone uh, really build something like this? I mean, all the all the tools really work in the way that they were described. Yeah, I mean, it's you know everything works the way it's supposed to. Uh, the I guess the the trouble would be deciding how you would apply it. So um, you know, again, this is kind of a publicity stunt, and so what the app is just doing basically is it's counting down for 15 seconds and every 15 seconds if you're not smiling when that countdown ends uh it jolts you so you could sit there and i could have not smiled for 15 seconds and then remember at the end of it like oh oh big grin and everything would be okay but you'd have to build a little bit more of a complex app i'm sure to actually make it something semi-useful so uh i'm a little bit psychologically disturbed at um because I'm kind of entertained by watching it. <laughs> and I don't know you, what that says. Not alone. Okay, good. That's that's what I wanted to hear, really. <laughs> I am going to kind of imagine that every Santa shoot uh, this Christmas where kids are going to sit on Santa's lap, that he is wearing this and being forced to smile all day. Oh, that would be amazing if mall Santa had to be shocked to make sure that he was smiling for all the kids all the time. I'm, yes. I like that. So I think this is interesting uh, from an advertising perspective uh, that there are like hackers uh, everywhere now, even like, you know, in ad agencies uh, that, that are making these devices, uh, maker madmen, um, I might call them. Uh, but what do you think it also says about wearables uh, in general? I mean, it, it says a lot of different things. I mean, if the... <laughs> The creative lead there, uh, John, who was in the video that you showed before, would tell you that this is sort of like trying to cut to the heart of the wearables movement as a whole. And that's about it's trying to make you a happier person or a better person. And, uh, you know, they do it in these little piecemeal ways by making sure that you're getting enough sleep or that you're healthy enough. And uh, there's ones that measure brain waves to make sure that, you know, you're zen enough or whatever. Um, so there's all these different things that they do, but they're not really being honest about what it is they're trying to trying to make happen like and that is that they want to make you a better happier person and this is kind of their sly commentary on saying like no that at the end of the day this is the ultimate goal well terrence o'brien smiling but your eyes are dead with pain <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what my apple watch is for <laughs> terrence thank you so much uh terrence o'brien is a managing editor at engadget uh, where he writes about real gadgets. Uh, um, and you can find him also on Twitter at Terrence O'Brien. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. So moving on to another uh, news story. By the end of 2015, according to Google, there will be more Chromebooks in schools than all other devices combined. Uh, in an interview with BuzzFeed, Apple CEO Tim Cook said Apple won't make the test machines taking over class classrooms, uh, I think that he, when he says test machines, he's talking about Chromebooks uh, because they are often used for state tests. Uh, it was an interesting argument. Uh, what do you think, Kashmir? Um, I was curious what Tim Cook does want to make. Um, what is it that he wants to put in classrooms that uh, aren't just about taking standardized tests? Have any ideas? <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, uh, my children have iPads in the classroom. Uh, and I, they had Chromebooks, um, but they replaced them with iPads. Someone had that, a better idea. I think it's interesting because there's no longer a keyboard. They're no longer lo learning to type, uh, which is an important skill. Uh, but everything is also locked down, uh, which is, is nice, except that they also use Google Classroom, which has come under fire recently. And the EFF had, you know, they had a complaint against them about, you know, how they were tracking kids. So it's confusing because it's like we're, we're not getting the benefits of the keyboard and the actual machine that a Chromebook is, uh, but then we're still getting, uh, they're still getting tracked in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah, that is the problem with all of the many education startups um, and is the reason why at least one has failed. Um, some people at least think it was because there were privacy concerns. Um, yeah, I mean, we do need to get technology into the classroom more. Um, uh, I, I kind of like the idea of having technology where kids are exploring the, the back end of it and, and how it works and like 
learning how to code as opposed to just the consumer experience of technology, I think they'll be better equipped by the former than the latter. I agree. And, you know, and, and maker tools too. It would be great if they could get that Santa beard shocker. I think that would be very popular in schools. Make something that shocks your friend for not smiling. Uh, that would be, in my opinion, better than a Chromebook or an iPad. So it is about the one year anniversary of the Sony hack. To celebrate, Google has created a new tool to help lock up corporate networks. Uh, if you are a Google Apps Unlimited customer, uh, they have created Data Loss Perfection, per Prevention, DLP, that will add another layer to Gmail uh, to prevent sensitive information from being revealed to those who shouldn't have it. That's what Google says in a blog post. Uh, do you think this is has the power to prevent something like the Sony hack? Well, I don't think it has the power to prevent the Sony hack since with the Sony hack, the hackers just got into their system and were going through everything. Um, it does seem like a really interesting idea for preventing um, data leakage uh, by employees emailing things out by accident. Um, but yeah, the, the Sony hack, you would need to do a lot more to actually like protect your, your servers and protect uh, or, or train people not to get fished. Um, but I liked what Google's described. I obviously like haven't tried it and haven't looked into it too deeply yet. But the idea is something that I've heard a lot of different security firms start to talk about as like basically track your sensitive information and how it's moving through um, how it's through, moving through your company, moving out of your company and prevent anything too sensitive from moving out. Right. That's a good point. The Sony hack was, you know, someone opened a file and then gave access. Correct. I, I was I didn't follow it as closely as I probably should have. Uh, but this is talking about so this is preventing someone just from not emailing uh Personal, I mean, yeah, this is, it sounds to me like uh, this would prevent somebody from attaching the, you know, the credit card transaction records um, for a whole bunch of your customers to an email by accident and then sending it out to, um, you know, a random person. Um, so, yeah, this is actually um, I had something like this happen with me. Uh, I'm a big Words with Friends player um, and my mom and I play Words with Friends a lot. And so we decide to request our files uh, from Zynga, which is the, the big gaming company. Um, and so Zynga was going to send us like all of our player records. And they, by accident, instead of attaching my mom's files to the email that they sent her, they, they sent this printout of a whole bunch of emails that they had exchanged about our data requests and many other people's data requests. So we got other people's names and what their problems were. And it was just, you know, a screw up by um, the outsourced employee that was doing this. And so maybe if they were using something like the Google tool it would prevent them from having leaked us information that they shouldn't have sent to us. Man, you were the wrong person for them to make a mistake to. <laughs> True. <laughs> I was very thankful. Yeah. <laughs> Just fell right into your lap. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, here's a quick story. According to The Verge, CES is banning hoverboards. They, of course, will sell them and show them off, but you can't ride yours around the showroom floor. Um, so I guess hoverboards are like the new selfie sticks. Yeah, surprisingly, they banned anything basically that has wheels. And I have, uh, it's a, a strange confession for a technology reporter, I've never gone to CES in person. Um, the only time I've gone is by Beam, the telepresence robot, which is basically like an iPad on a stick on wheels. And as I was reading, um, as I was reading the new rules for CES, I think that Beams would be disallowed along with hoverboards. Well, so you'll have to either go in person or not at all, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode is brought to you by Braintree, code for easy online payments. Maybe you're working on the next Uber, Airbnb, or GitHub. Why not use the same simple payment solution that helped them become what they are today? Braintree makes mobile payments fast and easy. Add it to your app with just a few lines of code, and you're instantly ready to accept Apple Pay, Android Pay, PayPal, Venmo, credit card, and even Bitcoin. And if some other way of to pay comes along, Braintree will support that too. See fewer abandoned carts and more sales with Braintree's best-in-class mobile checkout experience. Braintree gives you a full-stack payment solution support for all payment types your customers might want. Single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection and customer service. To check it out for yourself, visit braintreepayments.com slash TNT. And finally today, from the company that brought you Netflix and Chill comes generous Netflix parental leave, which is only appropriate uh, for all. So not just salaried employees. Uh, Netflix made an announcement about their really generous unlimited plan that was for salaried em employees. And I was asking, what about hourly employees? What about the people that put the DVDs in the envelopes? Uh, so now they will also get a generous uh, parental leave, moms and dads. 
uh, not unlimited, but they'll get up to 12 weeks of paid leave. Customer service will get uh, 14 weeks and hourly streaming division employees will get 16 weeks. So awesome. cash, yeah, it is great. Uh, <laughs> nothing to complain about. I, I will watch more Netflix now. Uh, so if you want to weigh in on any of these topics, you can email me at tnt at twit.tv. And our TNT fan of the day is Testy from Twitter, who posted the image of listening to us talk about the Yahoo sale while purchasing Yahoo Boardwalk on a Y2K throwback Monopoly board. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. Uh, Fusion editor, Kashmir Hill, thank you so much for joining us. What else are you working on right now? Just trying to find the real Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> So you're going to break the next story. I hope so. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. You can subscribe. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Take care. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, so many places. Choose your favorite way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific. And if you're ever in the San Francisco Bay Area, come in and watch us as part of our studio audience. You can send an email to tickets at twit.tv. You can also follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Also, don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight. I will be here at 4 p.m. reporting more stories, and I'll be here every weekday. And that is it for this Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Megan Maroney. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>